Good day, Grade Tents. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. Um, if you may recall, last week, Thursday, we started this lesson on electromagnetic radiation. Well, we actually finished waves and we started the week on electromagnetic radiation. And then, unfortunately, the a signal died with um, a Skype broadcast. So I'm going to start again because I'm not sure exactly when the Skype broadcast died. Um, I know it was early on in the lesson. So what I wanted to do is just remind you of where we were and what we spoke about in this question here with the waves and the compressions and wavelength. And in fact, what I'm going to quickly do just to make sure that you guys do actually understand what we're doing is I'm going to if I can get my mouse to cooperate. There we go. I'm going to quickly delete the writing and then I'm going to, there we go, let's delete it and then let's go back to the PowerPoint. There we go. And I just want to go through this again with you guys because it's very important that you guys know what this is about. Um, and remember that this is a longitudinal wave that we were talking about. We were talking about the longitudinal wave and we were talking about sound. Remember that sound is the only longitudinal wave that we know about. And we're going to answer some of these questions because these are typical exam type questions. It also kind of covers everything that you need to know about sound with except for your uses of sound such as um, radar and sonar and echolocation and that. So if you missed those lessons, feel free to go back and watch the recordings and you'll be able to learn about that. Okay, so it says, the sound wave was produced by vibrating musical instruments is represented in the diagram one below. So you can see that this is obviously a sound wave because the movement of the wave is in the same direction as the movement of the particles. It says, label the sections marked A and B. And that's another giveaway that this is a longitudinal wave because these are obviously compressions, compressions, and this bit B is obviously a wavelength and a wavelength is the distance obviously between two points in phase, two consecutive points in phase. But remember that with a wavelength it could be either from the middle of a compression to the middle of a compression or from the end of a compression to the end of a compression or the middle of a rarefaction to the middle of a rarefaction. And remember the rarefaction, I'm going to write it out here, rarefaction, not fraction, please note, rarefaction, that is the area where there is not a compression, in other words, it's between the compressions, is a rarefaction. Okay, now it says, 8.2, the position time graph in diagram 2 below represents the same sound wave produced by the musical instrument above. So what they've done is, don't get confused, although this looks like a transverse wave, okay, it, it says this is a position versus time graph in diagram two below represents the same sound wave, okay, produced by the musical instrument above. So it says name the type of wave represented in diagram two, and it is a transverse wave, but please understand that it still represents the sound, okay? It says which one of the points X, Y, and Z in diagram two corresponds to sections labeled A in diagram one. So remember that A is a compression and your compressions are the same as crests. So in this case, the correct answer is Y because Y is the crest, okay? A wavelength would be from X to Z, okay? It says the same note is now played on the instrument but much louder than before. How will this change affect the diagram, the graph in diagram two? And what is going to happen, and the reason that they have plotted the longitudinal wave as a transverse wave, is because they want you to be able to show this, and this is amplitude, 
amplitude. Remember that the amplitude of the wave gives us the loudness, okay? So in this case, it says the same notes are now played, but much louder than before. So it's going to have the same frequency. In other words, it's going to take the same amount of time to complete one wavelength. It's going to go through the same points, but the amplitude is going to be much bigger. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to go up a bit more and then down further and then through the same Oopsie, and they're supposed to be the same height. I'm terribly sorry that my drawing skills are not that great on this digital pen and pad. So, uh, and that always happens. So, basically, it's going to be the same height every time, remember? Because you guys always get nice, decent waves in your questions. So, this is supposed to be the same height. You guys, obviously, will be drawing this in with a pencil. Yes, remember you need to be drawing this with a pencil and you have an eraser, so it'll be easier for you guys to make it nice and neat. All right, so that is an amplitude and it's much louder, which means the amplitude's bigger. If I said it was softer, what would happen? Obviously, then the amplitude would be lower. So if this was softer, then it would be smaller than, so it would be down here. Okay, do you understand that? Right, now it says a note of a higher frequency but the same original loudness is played on the instrument. How will this change affect the graph in diagram two? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just erase the drawing on graph two. Please note, they didn't actually ask you to draw it, they just asked you to label it. And they said, how will this affect the change in the graph? It would actually increase your amplitude. So I would have to say that it would increase your amplitude. Now it says a note of higher frequency but the same loudness is now played. How will this change affect the graph? Well, if it has a higher frequency, it's going to have a shorter wavelength. How do I know that? I know that because of the wave equation. The wave equation says that V is equal to lambda F, where lambda is the wavelength, and F is the frequency. And what you can see is that if the speed of the wave is the same, which it will be because sound is a certain speed in a certain amount of air, certain type of air. So in this case, we could say that the speed would be um, 330 meters per second, okay? Then we would say, okay, fine. If the wavelength increases and the frequency has to decrease. If the frequency increases, the wavelength has to decrease. Okay, so we can say that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency, okay, or proportional to 1 over the frequency. So what did we say? We said that it's a higher frequency. So if it's a higher frequency, then what happens to the wavelength? It gets smaller, which means that this full length here gets shorter. But because it's the same loudness, it's going to have the same amplitude. So your correct answer for 8.2.4 would be that it'd have a shorter wavelength, but it would have the same amplitude. Now, I'm just going to draw it because a lot of times in the exams, they actually ask you to draw it instead of just label, explain it. So, all that they haven't said how much, they just said a higher frequency. So, all we need to do is draw this so that it ends earlier. Okay, so we could do it that it looks, but remember, it's going to have the same amplitude. Okay, so you can see that you end up with more waves in the same amount of time. Okay, the same amount of time. So if you look here, yeah, we've got one, two, three crests compared to one, two crests in the same, almost the same period. Okay, so we definitely, and please don't do this. I haven't corrected that because it's going to erase the whole thing. You will erase that because you will have drawn that with a pencil. Okay, so you'll see it's got the same amplitude. Okay, so therefore it's going to have the same height above and below the line, but it's got a higher frequency, which means the wavelength itself is much shorter. Okay, right. 
So that was the last the wave question. So now let's talk about electromagnetic radiation. Now, electromagnetic radiation fits in with wave for the simple reason that electromagnetic radiation happens to be a transverse wave. It happens to be a transverse wave. So everything that you remember that we learned about water waves and transverse waves fits in for this electromagnetic radiation. So let us look at this little video, and this I think is as far as we got. I'm just going to check. Um, hang on just a second. What is this? Why is it doing this? Keep. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to the slideshow from Karen's slide. There we go. So, um, don't worry about that. It's just saying I'm going on to the interweb, and do I really want to do it? And I do. I do. So, let's have a look. So what you can see here is there's an oscillating charge. And the oscillating charge is what causes this electromagnetic radiation. So what is happening is that an oscillating charge is an, an either an electron or maybe something with more than one electron on it. And it is a charge and it moves up and down. That's what we mean by oscillating. And as it moves up and down, it causes an electric field around it and a magnetic field around it. And the electric field, if the electric field happens to be going vertically, then the magnetic field is going horizontally. So you can see vertical year, horizontal year, vertical year, horizontal year. We'll talk about directions in a second. You will also notice that if I could, I would be able to draw a line going along. So there it goes down, and then it goes up. So you can see it forms the same type of wave shape as a transverse wave, right? Similarly, this one is going to go uh, through and through. And you need to think of this as 3D. So what is happening is, and this is very important as well, and you can see it very well in these two. As the electric field gets bigger, so the magnetic field gets bigger. And as the magnetic field gets the electric field gets smaller, the magnetic field gets smaller, okay? And then when it swaps, so does the magnetic field. So yeah, the electric field is pointing down and the magnetic field happens to be pointing into the page. Whereas yeah, the electric field is pulling, pointing up and yeah, the electric field is pointing out of the, uh, out of the page. And you need to understand that this is a, an image, this is a drawing for you to try and understand the electric field and magnetic fields. And what you need to understand is electric fields and magnetic fields always act at 90 degrees to each other. But then just to really mess with your minds, this is three dimensional. So it doesn't actually, the electric field doesn't actually just work vertically and horizontally, vertically, and the magnetic field doesn't work horizontally. The electric field works all 360 degrees and the magnetic field works all 360 degrees. But the electric field is always, always perpendicular to the magnetic field. So what happens here is that an oscillating charge, charge goes up and down, it causes there to be a magnetic field that goes, say, for example, up and down, which then in turn causes a magnetic field to go left and right. Okay, so that's the electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic wave. Okay, so although it's quite complicated and is three dimensional and everything else, when we discuss it, we tend to think of it only as a two dimensional. Um, or it's still three dimensional, but when we discuss what it can do, as in like the fact that it can refract or reflect or whatever, we think of it just as a transverse wave because it has the same nature as a transverse wave, even though it is a full three dimensional wave. Okay, so now let's talk a bit more about electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic waves have an electric and magnetic component that are always acting at right angles to each other. So it's just really summarizing everything I've just said. The electromagnetic wave is started when a charged particle accelerates. Okay, so it's not a neutral particle and has to be a charged particle. And what do they talk about acceleration? Now, grade 10s, I just want to remind you about when you learned about movement, okay? And we spoke about velocity and we spoke about displacement and acceleration. 
do you remember that acceleration is a change in velocity over change in time? Okay, acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time, but this is a vector. So I don't have to change the amount of my velocity, I can just change the direction and that would cause it to accelerate. So the whole point about this oscillating particle, the fact that it goes up and down, means that it keeps changing direction. And because it keeps changing direction, it means that the particle is accelerating. And that is why we have an electromagnetic wave that is formed. It causes an electric field to oscillate in one plane, which in turn produces a magnetic field in the plane at right angles to each other, which causes another magnetic field and so on and so on and so on. So it forms, it's a kind of a chain reaction. All electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light, which is three times by 10 to the eight meters per second. This is obviously in a vacuum which outer space is very close to. So all your electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light because light is part of the electromagnetic radiation. Okay, and that is designated the little c. So this little c is the speed of light, which is three times by 10 to the eight meters per second. It is on your data sheets and your formula sheets. So you don't have to remember it. Right, so now let's talk a little bit about the dual nature of light. You need to understand that the dual nature of light, you don't really learn much about this year, but you do learn a lot about it in grade 12. And you need to understand it a little bit, okay? So all electromagnetic radiation can be reflected, refracted, diffracted, polarized, and can undergo constructive and destructive interference. Okay, and you will think, well, okay, all of this phenomena shows that obviously this is a, got a wave nature, okay? Because waves can be reflected, they can be refracted, they can be diffracted, they can be polarized, and can they can undergo constructive and destructive interference. We've seen all of that in our waves, okay? So therefore we can say, well, it's pretty obvious that a wave, I mean, that electromagnetic radiation is a wave, but there is also evidence to indicate the particle nature. Now, you need to know about the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is pretty cool. And before I explain it to you, I want to just tell you what our uses are. A typical, typical use for the photoelectric effect is your solar panels. And if any of you got those very cool calculators, I think they're Casios, um, which I've got a little... Casios, yeah, the FX991ES plus whatever. They've got like a little a four panel thing at the, above the screen. Okay, that's actually, and you don't need to put batteries in it ever. Um, that is actually a mini solar panel, which is pretty cool. And basically you don't um, need to put a battery in because it is getting energy from the light source. Now the photoelectric effect is used in the solar panel. And the way it works is that you've got light of a specific frequency hits a type of metal. Okay, not all metals work like this, but some metals do. So when light of a specific frequency hits that metal, it's going to emit or eject an electron. Okay, and that electron is then electricity. Okay, that's the short version of it. Okay, you will learn the long version. And this is evidence that in fact, electromagnetic uh, radiation has a particle nurture. We call these little particles photons. Okay, so let's watch this little video here of a guy. What he's got here is he's got a Coke. Well, let's watch it and then I'll talk you through it. So he's basically using static electricity to um, charge up these little, um, it's actually just tin foil, and then he's using the coke tin as the scent, and when he touches it, he grounds it. Okay, so now shine TV right on it, and look what happens. Okay, so what is happening now, let me just go back, okay, is the man takes his Okay, wait. So what he's got, he's got a little Diet Coke tin and he's got a stick and he's got some, uh, this looks like tin foil, that's thin strips of tin foil, okay? And what he's doing is he's taking some, I think it's a cloth, 
it might be sandpaper, and a plastic tube. And by rubbing it, he's trans he's using static electricity and he's transferring electrons onto this, okay? He then brings it close to the, I don't know if he brings it close or touches it, let's see, he touches it. Okay, he touches the t this tinfoil and by touching it, he is allowing the electrons to transfer from the rubber, from this, from this uh, plastic pipe onto yeah so now they got lots and lots of electrons okay so what do they do because they got lots of electrons they repel each other so they stand up okay now what happens is he's going to touch the tin and by doing that what has happened is all these excess electrons have traveled down up the pieces of tin foil down this piece of metal and onto this coke tin diet coke tin and onto his finger and he's actually neutralized it okay then he does it again that was just to show you that it definitely had a charge and he gets it all charged up now what's he going to do so now this again has got lots and lots and lots of electrons okay on it very very electrony electrony it's got a high concentration of electrons okay so then what's going to happen is he's going to shine a light onto it it's a uv light so he shines a light on and look what happens to the metal okay do, so what is happening is that the metal, I'm just going to do this quickly, the metal, because when he shines the light on it, the metal is actually allowing the electrons to be removed from these pieces of metal. So the light is got enough energy that it causes the electrons to be removed from the metal and so then because they then are neutral they then fall black flat okay so it's exactly what we just said that what happens is you've got photons of light that hit a metal but this you'll notice that that was a uv light okay different um, metals require different light sources um, and, and light energies, but that's we can discuss later in grade 12. So basically, you've got a certain type of light that's got enough of a, it's got the right frequency that allows energy, the, the, the hits a piece of paper, oh sorry, hits metal, and it causes the electrons to be emitted. And that's the photoelectric effect. See how it works. The photo, the photons hit it, and what do we get out? Electrons. Okay, so that's the photoelectric effect. And that is the basic proof that the light has both a particle nature and a wave nature. So photons have a specific frequency and energy. Now, what's important is that this threshold frequency has a minimum energy required to eject an electron from a metal by a photon. Okay, so we've got E is equal to HF, and this is Einstein's equation. In fact, well, I know it's, it's Planck's constant, but it's Einstein's equation. In fact, this is the equation that Einstein, I know that all of you have somewhere in your past gone around going E equals MC squared. Okay, which is very famous because Einstein did come up with this equation, which relates to mass and uh, how fast you travel to the amount of energy required to travel. Um, but this year is what he actually got his Nobel Peace Prize for, his Nobel Prize, okay, for Einstein. What he did was he realized that there was a relationship between the amount of energy and the frequency. So he said E was the energy of the photon, H is Planck's constant, which you get given, which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second, joule seconds, okay, and F is the frequency of the photon. And he says there's obviously a relationship between the energy of the photon and the frequency, and all you have to do is multiply it by Planck's constant. And Planck was a very, I know he's not as famous as Einstein, but he was quite a famous scientist who worked on a whole bunch of stuff to do with light and energy, and he came up with that constant. So E is equal to HF, but we know that V is equal to lambda F, that there is the wave equation and I know it's on your formula sheet but you also need to be able to recognize it. Now because we're talking about the electromagnetic radiation the speed of this radiation is always the speed of light so we can replace it with a c. So c is equal to lambda frequency right? 
So now we've got the frequency of the photon. So if we solve this for f, what do we get? We get c over lambda. So if we put that in there, we substitute it in, we end up with hc over lambda. So e is equal to hf, which equals hc over lambda. So a typical way that we can use this is it says, what is the energy of a photon that has a frequency of 576 hertz? Okay, so before we carry on, we need to make sure we know Planck's constant. It is on your formula sheets. And as I've mentioned to you before, grade tens, it's really important that you actually have your formula sheets and your data sheets near you when you are studying science so that you can actually use this information, like your periodic table if we're doing chemistry. Okay, so it's 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds. So let's write that over there. H equals 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds, okay? Now they said, what is the energy of the photon which has a frequency of 576 hertz? So we check the unit and it's correct. It's not kilohertz, it's not anything else. So is it perfect? So E is equal to HF, okay? The H is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34 multiplied by the frequency of 576. So all we need to do is get out our calculators and bring them across and clear them. Okay, and we got 6.63 exponent negative, negative, negative 34. Hmm, still not doing my negative. Negative 34 multiplied by 576 equals and it's 3.82 times 10 to the minus 31 okay it equals 3.82 times by 10 to the minus 31 and what is energy measured in energy is measured in joules energy is measured in joules right okay so that is a typical example that you might be asked to do now it says, if I tell you that the wavelength of the wave is 92 meters, can you calculate the energy of the radiation? So we know that E equals HF, right? And remember H again is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative. Do you remember? It's negative 34 joules seconds. Okay. We also know that C is equal to lambda frequency. And what are they given us? They've given us the H we know is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. We know the wavelength is 92. We know that C is 3 times by 10 to the 8. And what do we want? We want the energy. Okay, so we've got E is equal to HF, but we also know that C is equal to lambda F. So what can we do? We can solve for F. So we can say F is equal to C over lambda. We're just dividing both sides here by lambda. Okay, now if that's the case, we can substitute in this. So it becomes HC over lambda. H is Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34, multiplied by the speed of light, which is 3 times by 10 to the 8, all divided by the wavelength, which we've been told is 92, and we check is that is the SI unit. Now all we need to do is get out a calculator, and I went right past it. There we go. And we can go 6.63 exponent negative 34. Hmm. 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 equals, I forgot to put brackets in, that's why I'm doing it like that, divided by 92 equals and there you go 2.16 remember we're always running off to two decimal places so it's 2.16 times by 10 to the negative 27 so it's 2.16 times by 10 to the negative 27 and what is energy measured in energy is measured in joules excellent right now let's do a final example it says the energy of a given radiation is 6,000 joules. What is the frequency of the radiation? 
Okay, remember that E is equal to H frequency, so it's actually a very easy question. H again is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. Okay, we know the energy is 6,000 joules, so we got 6,000 is equal to 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34 multiplied by the frequency. So in other words, what do we need to do? We need to divide both of these by... Six point six three times by ten to the negative thirty four. Okay, so therefore frequency is equal to, and let's go look. We're gonna have six thousand divided by six point six three exponent negative thirty four equals. And it's 9.05 times by 10 to 36. 9.05 times by 10 to 36. And what is frequency measured in? It's measured in hertz. Don't forget to put the unit in. It's very important. Right, now let's talk a little bit more about electromagnetic spectrum. So we know that electromagnetic radiation is a transverse wave. And we know it can travel through a vacuum. And we know that all of the radiation is at a speed of 3 times by 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now let's talk a little bit more about exactly um, what exactly is happening with respect to the different ranges. And I'm going to talk about each of these individually, but you need to understand how they fit onto the spectrum. Okay, so your highest energy ones are going to have the highest frequency. Makes sense. E is equal to HF, right? So if you've got a high frequency, it means you're going to have a very high energy. So therefore, the higher the energy, the more dangerous. More dangerous. Okay, so if you look at this, yeah, you've got gamma rays. I've got a very high frequency, which means they've got a very short wavelength. Okay, then we've got X, and we know that gamma rays are very dangerous. If you don't know what gamma rays are, think about nuclear power or nuclear guns. Nuclear power or nuclear, uh, or nuclear bombs. Okay, this is gamma radiation. Okay, and we know how dangerous that is. Next up is x-rays. Okay, now we do use x-rays quite a lot, but again, it is quite dangerous. And But that's quite a high frequency as well. Next up is ultraviolet. Now, we know that ultraviolet is pretty dangerous. I mean, we have UV rays or ultraviolet rays on the Earth, and we know that that's what burns us. So that's pretty dangerous. Then we've got a part of the spectrum which is visible. Okay, that's the visible part. On the right hand side, in this case, on the slightly longer side of the spectrum is infrared. Now, infrared can be used to, and we'll talk about this specifically, but infrared can be used to see things in the dark, okay, so, which is pretty cool. And we will talk about each of these specifically, so don't freak out about it if you think you can't. Next up is a microwave. Okay, I mean, I'm not just talking about the cooking of food, although the microwaves that we buy these days do cook food, there are other versions of the microwave as well. And then finally, your longest wavelengths are called radio waves. And you can see, which is very interesting, is that this goes down to about 10 to the minus 13, and it goes up to one, sorry, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Okay, let me just write that out for you, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters and this the wavelength is can be about one kilometer or even more couple more kilometers so just to put this in perspective this is 10 to the minus 16 meters okay whereas this is 1000 meters so that's how much bigger this is compared to that Okay, now let's talk about them individually. First of all, your gamma rays. Okay, so you need to understand that radio materials are amazing in the sense that they naturally give off energy. So for example, I can put, um, I don't know, my mouse pad, my mouse in front of me, on the mouse pad in front of me, 
on the desk and it'll do nothing to me. It just sits there and I will work with it and it does nothing to me. Okay, it might irritate me a bit, but it doesn't actually harm me physically. But if I had to take a piece of radioactive material and put it on the desk, within a few minutes, it would have radiated out large amounts of energy and have done me quite serious damage okay so the rays from the gamma rays are emitted by naturally occurring radioactive materials and are byproduct of nuclear reactions the gamma rays are byproduct of nuclear reactions so that is a beautiful picture in space of an exploding nebula and what it is giving out is lots and lots of energy and that energy is in the form of gamma rays these rays have a very high frequency and are very high energy so the greatest penetrating ability of all the electromagnetic radiation and they are most dangerous to man. Now, what's interesting about gamma rays is that they are used in medical practice as well. Um, they are, there are improvements on the methods nowadays um, using nucleotides, but until certain things happen, the gamma radiation is used as it is. So let's say, for example, you have some cancer. So what they will do, and there's a place out in Fora, which is outside of Cape Town, where they actually do this. Okay. Say, for example, you have some cancer. So what they will do is they will make you lie. And yes, I'm going to draw a stick figure now. They make you lie on a table. And let's say that your cancer is in your head. Okay, and it's over, let me make it a different color. And it's over here. Okay, so what they do in the middle of your head. So what they do is that they take some gamma rays and they point them at your head and they try and target just those few cells there. And by targeting them, they hope to kill them. The problem with this method is that obviously, as you can see, let me draw it a bit bigger so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's say this is the head, okay, here's your eye, and your nose would be sticky outy, and there's your mouth, and there's your ear, okay, really? Okay, there we go. So there's, an, I don't know, there's, and there's some hair. Okay, so now that's your head lying down, right? Now let's say that the thing that they're trying to aim at, the tumor, is lying over here. So if they take their gamma radiation gun, okay, their gamma gun, and they point it at that point there, okay, so they've got this very thin stream of gamma rays that are coming out. So do you agree that in order for it to target exactly that point, there's all this here that needs to be got through? So all of that is going to, even though it is transferring the energy, it's going to absorb some of that energy, okay? Then what happens is some of that energy gets repelled outward as well. That means that around the area, there might be some damage as well. So this method of radiation therapy, it's called radiation therapy radiation therapy is not the best way for a person to be healed because of the fact that the radiation does hurt the tissues around the cancerous cells. It is, however, one of the best ways to handle brain tumors um, with that is quite deep in. Okay, they can actually target it. There are a whole bunch of other types of radiotherapy out there now. I mean, this is just a very basic version. Okay. Right, moving on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and there's a little picture that is much better than my picture. Okay, so there's your tumor and there's your gamma rays. And what they're doing is they're using the gamma rays from these points here to aim at the tumor. But do you see that you've got all the skin that you need to get through, skin and body. So obviously they're trying to concentrate the most and the highest intensity gamma radiation over here in the center where the tumor is, but there will be some damage to the body from the radiation in between as well. Okay, grade 10, that's it for today. To, I mean, on Tuesday, we will start off with x-rays and we'll talk some more about electromagnetic radiation. I hope you have a wonderful day.